Exploring Ideas. I'm Elaine Smitha. We uh, have with us a ufologist, uh, Ralph Meany, and he uh, lives in the Pacific Northwest area. And uh, I had met him several years ago when, Rich when Richard Hoagland was here, and we actually sat across the table eating uh, a dinner after uh, Richard had given a presentation. And Ralph and I became uh, friends, and all my times of trying to get him to come down here before had met with with no answer at the other end of the phone so this time I managed to get to him so we're gonna have him tell us about his extraordinary experiences and he has had many extraordinary experiences he has had all kinds of contacts rides on alien spaceships and paranormal experiences and this is gonna be quite a show join me in welcoming Ralph Meany thank you I'm glad you're here, finally. finally yes. <laughs> we had so many tr times trying to get together and didn't work. Uh, you started off as a child with having weird experiences? Yes. My first one was uh, May or June, 1941, when my mother was pregnant. With you? No, with my sister. No. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was born in 37. <laughs> So I wasn't quite four years old yet, because okay. you know, I was born August 12th, which is a strange date. August 12th is the Montauk Project and a lot of others. That's true. Yeah, a lot of other things that NASA does and the government does on August 12th. That's true. Which I've noticed lately. I have too. And uh, my mother had to go to the drugstore to get something for medication of some kind. My father, we were in this little uh, coupe with a rumple seat in the back, you know, back in the 30s, something of the 30s. and. Uh, I went with them, and uh, they came out of the store. We all come out of the store, and uh, the drugstore, and, and I see this plane right in Pepsi Cola in the sky, which caught, the noise of the plane caught my attention. That's off to the right. But off to the left, I see this huge word pe uh, piece written in the sky. Really? I mean, it's gigantic in size, and it was a pencil writing the word. And my mother said it was a word piece. My father said, piece? That's interesting. This is before the war. <laughs> oh, that's weird. And uh, we looked at it and watched it, and I never forgot it. Was this when the planes used to write? It's like a plane wrote. Plane this writing in the sky. Yeah, but this wasn't a plane. This was a pencil. A pencil. Shaped object. And the plane, would say, was the size of a dime, and this was the size of a baseball bat. Interesting. In size, comparison. Wow. It was huge. And right away, UFO. It's an unidentified flying object. Then, uh, and just recently, I was talking to a lieutenant colonel, retired lieutenant colonel from the Air Force. I told him about it. He said, I'm the second person he's heard that from. Really? Over where the war is now, I think he said it was eight years ago, approximately, some, the same thing happened over there. The word peace was written in the sky. Interesting. So, which, which is kind of interesting. In other words, someone has given us a message, stop the wars. Mm. Well, I think we, we would like all to do that. Peace, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what was the next instance? The next one, uh, uh, when the war started, <coughs> my father had to go to Portland, Maine, work in the South Portland shipyard. He was, a, he was an FBI agent at the time. Really? As far as I know. I saw his badge, so I know. And we lived outside of Portland, had a farm, three-acre farm, because we had to grow our own food, victory gardens and stuff. And, yes. Uh, in my bedroom, which is on the southeast, southwest corner of the house, Every, from 43 to 45, I kept on seeing holograms in the ceiling of a freight yard with cigar-sized objects coming out of the wall and traveling down and going on the sightings. And the, like four or five, the park, one would park them, and another one would go back, bring them back another load, you know. This went on every single day, rain or shine. Now, this was, you, this was a vision that you saw. My this was not out your window. It was not my window. It was in my ceiling. Coming and you were laying down. Laying down the bed. My father even saw it. Really? We couldn't, f we tried to figure out where it came from. We couldn't find out where it came from. It didn't make sense. But when the war ended, it disappeared. <laughs> really strange. Wow. And when the war ended, we moved uh, just outside of Boston, a little town called Sherbin, Mass, and which is next to Framingham, which is kind of 20 miles out of Boston. Mm -hmm. and we had an 18-acre farm. And a lot of strange stuff started happening in my life. But uh, one of the strangest things is we're walking uh, in, the, in the late 40s. 
to check the hay. We had horses, and we had about 22 goats, and we had ducks and geese and everything. And we walk along the edge of the apple orchard, which is about 300 feet from the road, the apple orchard. And between the apple orchard and the road was the hay fields. And our driveway went up the center of the property. And the house is 500 feet from the road. It was in the center, actually dead center of the property almost. And uh, we're coming down from the north side of the apple orchard along the edge of the field. And I get this feeling I'm going to do something strange. And we got down near the driveway. And I told my mother and father, watch me. I'm going to levitate. You told them that in advance? Told them in advance. And I start running towards the road. And I just go up in the air, about 100 feet in the air. I must have been about 13 feet or 14 feet off the ground. And I looked down and I screamed. My God. I should have never screamed. That woke you up. It's, the fear stopped me from doing what I could have been doing. Because the vision I had, I just would have traveled around the area in the air above the treetops. What did your parents think about this? Um, they were silent all the time. <laughs> did a, they know something that you didn't know? I think they may have known something. But when I went to school, I was treated different from everybody else. The teachers. They thought you were weird, right? No, they didn't think I was weird. I, <laughs> I was treated like I was someone like some royalty or president's son or something oh, like really? that. Oh, really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. And your father worked for the FBI. He, that's what he supposedly did. Well, what do you think? He did work for him, I know, because I saw his badge and his ID. And in the top of it, in his bureau drawer at the top was all full of pistols and badges. Really? even other government badges, and even state badges. And during the shipyard, uh, member of the he broke up the Communist Party strike back in 43. They tried to have a strike. And someone at midnight pushed him, and he fell from the top of the Liberty, Liberty ship to the bottom and laid there for seven hours. Oh, my. And six, 15 or 16 months later, he's out of the hospital, perfect, perfectly healed. And then... Uh, but what did get, your mother say about all this? She, she was silent on this stuff. Never said a word? No, never said a word. Very quiet. She took care of the animals and stuff, and he did all his stuff. Is your mother and father still living? My father died around uh, 89, April, and uh, my mother's still alive. She's 87 now. Does she ever remember? Oh, yes. Does she talk to you about it now? Yeah, every time I go to Florida for Christmas for two months now, uh, she comes up with stuff I have forgotten about. And it's unbelievable some of the things she talks about, unexplained things. Did she ever have any insights as to why you were gifted this N way? No, she never did. Because she's gifted somewhat, too. It's like... Interesting. Uh, she used to f fly with Amelia Earhart back in 1931. Really? She had her own uh, Stearman plane. My gosh. And I have a photograph of her and Amelia Earhart in the 99ers club from back then. Because she was in the flying, and when she got married, she didn't do it anymore. Because mm. uh, she's in the family, you know. And this is very strange, uh, some of the things that she even talks about. Like I have uh, on tape uh, right here where she tried to spank me and couldn't touch my body. If you want me to play it? Well, if, we, if, we're, if our mice can pick it up. I could play it right here. Okay. Try it. That was about me. Okay. You're a naughty little boy. You need a spanking. And I tried to spank you. And I didn't get any further close to your body than 12 inches. Something seemed to be holding my wrist. Every time I tried to go down, it stopped me. Sorry. I couldn't hit you. I went on for about five minutes. You need a spanking, but your angel wasn't permitting it. Evidently, he didn't think so. <sighs> an angel didn't think That's so. That's what she took it as, an angel. I love it. And here they have all this kid stuff about spanking kids, you know. <laughs> oh, golly, that's great. <laughs> and, um, it's good that you're getting this recorded, Ralph. Uh, that's what I'm trying to do. I, I want to go down there and have someone record everything on film for me of the things while she's still alive. Yes, I think so. Because she has some stuff that the, even down there they can't believe they witnessed. People have witnessed, you know. My father, he, I, I don't know why, he could never talk about this. Do you think that uh, the government told him not to talk about so, it? I think so, because... Uh, or do you think he had connections with 
some other force. He had something because when the, we moved to Massachusetts, he ended up being the, the, the manager of Bartlett Tree, the tree company back there, for, his, for the Boston district area. He was in the tree business. At the same time, he was having meetings on, uh, with an FBI agent sitting in the car in the driveway many times a month. So it was a cover. It's a cover. He's like, uh, I led three lives almost. He was doing two jobs, and he was in the politics. Anytime someone big came to the state, he was involved with He them? was involved. So how did you manage in school? I mean, did they treat you special? Most of the time, yeah. And did you excel in your studies? No. It's like, it's funny, too. I received a message back when I was in school in the early 50s or maybe late 40s saying to me, you don't have to know the English language. It's going to be a language of the past very soon. The whole world's going to speak one language. And what will that be? I don't know. That's what I was told. Hmm. And I was told everything from the early middle 50s up to 1998, what was going to happen to me. And did so it? I, it did. I knew everything in detail, pretty much. Even who, who I was going to marry, where she came from, where she lived. And yet, and it was funny, I dated all the ladies in that one area of a square mile. And she wasn't there. She happened to be in California instead of Boston area. When her mother died, she came back. Instead of me going to, her, to find her, she came to me. Wow. Which was very interesting. <laughs> you, <clears throat> they figured, well, you tried all the other ladies. Yeah. You might as well try this one, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, I told her she's going to have two boys. We had two boys. I told her everything, you know. I knew I was going to be married 21 years before I even met her. Years before I met her in their 50s. And I didn't meet her until 1990, August of 90. So you just got married? I mean, 90, I mean 70, rather. Oh, I was going to say. Not I'm a couple of decades off, right? I was about to yeah. what? <laughs> But uh, another thing, back in the early 50s, I received a, a piece of sculpture from Pope Pius XII. Oh, yes, you have it here. With and why did camera the, to and, pick this up. And why did the Pope... Here, yeah, let me hold it for you. ...send me this piece of sculpture. Golly. He sent it to, to, Card to Archbishop Cushing in Boston before he became Cardinal. Wow. And he called my father and told him to come pick it up for Ralph Meany Jr. And we had it in a house in the wall for many years. Really? And it's uh, 700 made. This is number four. And it's got pure gold on it. Really? There's only three of these in this country. Interesting. That it's known about. Well, I can see that it has the uh, Vatican uh, marking on the back here. That's pretty incredible. Why, you know? But you don't know why you got it? I don't know it? why I got it. Ah. I still don't know why today. I'm just trying to find that out, tracing back my history and everything else. Have you ever tried to contact the Vatican about it? Not yet. I think I'd start there. I've got to find the right person to do it, you know. <laughs> well, there's, they've got a lot of priests over there. Yeah. I'm sure somebody's in charge of that. My gracious. But then uh, I have on tape here another strange thing happened about the same time in the early 50s. Mm -hmm. Plus I was seeing UFO ships all the time back then. You see, still see them? Still see them. And what was f funny, our property was in a triangle of power lines. Really? And to the north of oh, us... Oh, interesting. Do you think you've got some cross current there? I don't know. I used to get 46 volts off them through my radio antenna on my house. Because I, I was in the shortwave radio and stuff, listening to the shortwave. <laughs> Golly, Ralph. And the, the, the power lines joined across the road, and about a mile they went up over top of a hill. And I could see that from my house because of the clearing, the angle where I was at. And I used to see these lights up on top of the, the hill over the power lines almost every night. Very rarely you didn't see them. Oh, I've heard that, they, uh, that alien spaceships and entities draw energy off of those mm -hmm. electrical lines, off of the power lines. And this one day I asked my father, I said, what are those lights up there? So, so he says, you stay here. And I'll, he got in his car, he went around the back road, got up to the top of that hill, came back and said, don't discuss this, you know nothing. Really? Dropped the subject. I knew for sure, but it, I had already seen ships over my house. And, this one, uh, and there was one over the Jellin Motors plant one night, about 10 o'clock, 
maybe a thousand or so, two thousand feet above the plant, you could see the lights of the plant reflecting off the bottom of the ship. That was in 1956. Wow. And I was going to go get on my bicycle because I didn't have my driver's license because I was still in high school and go up to the security gate and tell the, the guard about it. And I said, no, I better not. Mm-hmm. That stayed there for some time. Really? Then another night, about 10 o'clock, I came out of the house because I heard helicopters. And I think it was, I thought it was for some time, I've been thinking it was 63, but more I go back and talk to my mother, it was around 57. Because I remember I still had a boat, a sailboat against a pine tree, a great big pine tree. I had to put a bottom on it, 14-foot sailboat. So wow. That was still, you were busy. That was still there. So uh, I saw this triangular ship with a helicopter in each corner, a couple hundred feet above my house. And uh, it just hovered there. Then it started heading northeast, very slow, probably, I'd say, 30 miles an hour. Did they, w was there a pattern in the direction that these flowed? Yeah. They seemed to flow northeast. Because there was a northeast to me, there was an Air Force base, small one, in Bedford, Mass. Then there was one up in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which would be northeast of me from where I was, which they had seen uh, ships over the power lines at that base, too, drawing power. That was in the, on the radio a lot talked about back then. Did you have any idea of where they were coming from? No idea. Yet I'd see them and say, oh, it's like looking at a crow flying around. It didn't excite me. Yet I knew what they were. Well, you were very comfortable with them for some reason. Yeah. And, uh, and during the 50s, I got into doing hawks. In the hawks, I watched the sky all the time. That's what you said. And where I look for hawks and falcons, I spot ships, too because my eyes are in the sky, instead of looking down at the ground all the time like everybody else does. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I got into falconry, and I was training hawks and everything else to hunt and stuff like that. And, uh, and for, for my high school science fair project, my senior year, I had planned five years ahead of time to document the whole life cycle of the hawk. I had photographed the eggs being laid, the coming out of the eggshell, just barely hold his head up, you know, that mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. right on through till it was full growing. And, uh, That's I, pretty impressive for a high school project. Yes, and the judges uh, refused to give me first place. They said I couldn't have done the job. They said it was National Geographic quality. Oh. Because I did all the photography. I made all the prints and enlargements. I mean, I've, I've seen some of your photographs. I'm very impressed with your yeah. photography then, ability. Uh, <laughs> I had my own dark room in my house and everything because mm. I couldn't afford to have well, it done it really right. wasn't fair of them to make a judgment like that, that, you know, that you shouldn't get it just because it was so professionally done. Yeah, but uh, I had planned it. It took me time to do it. Uh -huh. How did you feel when they didn't give you the first prize? It got me a little mad, but, but then I, they, uh, where I had won second place, I, uh, they put me in Worcester Polytech. They showed my exhibit there, which is in a college in Worcester, Mass. Then I was put in MIT. Then I was on television for my first time, uh, giving a talk on Channel 2 back there. Really? The education program <laughs> in May of 57, <laughs> which was really a surprise to me because I had live birds in my exhibit. Wow, that's got to be impressive. And I never wore gloves with them. Did you ever get scratched? No, or? they wouldn't. I could w put my hand out and they'd land on my hand and never dig their talons in. Really? But uh, another strange thing happened on the farm. It was about the early 50s. As we're, we dug a duck pond. We needed w water all the time for our ducks and geese and our horses and stuff and the goats. And, and that was kind of on the northwest corner of the property. So my father and I are down there, my mother. And we're looking over the, the pond, checking it out, make sure it's OK. And I look off to the southwest over a swamp land was about several hundred acres of swamp behind me and above the treetops I could see this object coming at us. It's coming slowly towards us and it's a, what it is, it's a platform and you can see people standing on it. Really? Like a flying carpet. Oh my gosh. And I'll play the tape of my mother describing it. Okay. Oh, that, that thing that I saw walking up from the pond to the house that that uh, platform, 
It looked like Jesus. It was a man with blondish hair and a long robe down to his feet. Now, it looked like Jesus with other people in front of him, about at least three people in front of him. And I traveled along above till I got to the house. How high up? High as the ceiling in any normal house. A little bit high, about as high as, as, as about 13 feet, say. We were down at the pond, all of us? You walked out the pond, and I walked up to the house by myself. And the pond's about 300 feet from the house. Well, this was, this was, uh, 300 feet or so. Say, this was about in the middle of the driveway. Interesting. Very interesting. And that's what I did. I followed it behind it, analyzing it, you know. Really? And uh, my father never said a word. Even afterward, never spoke a word of what he saw. <laughs> oh, gosh. And you must have had an interesting household. I mean, yeah. all this, there was stuff going on, and you never, never talked about it. I know it. And uh, as it came to the house, it levitated over the house. The house is about a total of three stories high. It was a tall house, old colonial type. And as it came down the other side, we had apple trees on the other side. It hovered above the apple trees. And when it came to the power line, it disappeared. And uh, there is something going on with those power lines. Very, I mean, it was unbelievable. I must have watched it for, oh, for over five minutes. It was quite some time watching it. Interesting. And I wish I had camera back then. You know? Oh, yes, I think so. Well, you have a lot of photographs to show of, mm -hmm. of, uh, of things. Uh, let's let's. Draw out, draw out some of those. You probably have to take those out of there, and you'll have to right. hand them to me because there's a way okay. to hold these so we don't get so much reflection. What I'll do, I'll go back to uh, nineteen ninety five. No, this is nineteen ninety seven. Okay. Now, this looks very similar. I've seen some things that, um, that Dr. Tiller, I, I'm, I think I may, have his, I may have his phone number or way for you to get in touch with him. I like to him. talk to him. I think that you should because he has a whole collection of, of photography um, examples of energetic, energetics, mm -hmm. of uh, all kinds of forms, and uh, this is really very interesting because this shows a uh, movement of energies. It's, it's all interwoven. There's even faces on it, human faces or alien faces, uh -huh. which make it uh, very strange. Yes, you, you and Dr. Tiller have got to get together. I'm surprised you haven't um, encountered him. I've been working with a, with a Dr. Bruce Cornett back in New Jersey on this. Really? He's involved I, with the same thing. He's, he's got lots of copies of these things. Okay. He's been getting from other people, too. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, you talked about uh, some healing that occurred. Yeah, I've, uh, I've done some healing for people. And uh, there was a case of a woman had uh, cancer. And I was with this woman's group I got invited to on a Monday night for meditation because of my strange things I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, this one night, uh, they wanted to heal this woman. had. She was going to the hospital on Wednesday for a major operation. And uh, we started a little healing ceremony, and all of a sudden, I'm starting to radiate heat, tremendous heat around. Everybody mm -hmm. could feel it in the room mm -hmm. coming off my body. Mm -hmm. I was like I was in an oven. I was so hot. She goes to the hospital Wednesday, not a trace of cancer in her body. Oh, my gosh. Completely vanished. Wow. And uh, I've done several cases like that. Really? And I've had cases where people's cars, like there was a bank manager of a bank in Totem Lake one night. I saw her car with a hood up, and I said, no, I'll help this lady, you know? So I pull over to stop and help her, and she says, oh, mechanics were on my car for an hour and 15 minutes, can't make it run. And the hood's open, and she's on her phone talking to her uh, husband, who, who's on his way, and I take my hands, went over the engine, just scan them across the engine. I said, okay, now start your car, and it starts right up. <laughs> oh, gosh, Ralph. <laughs> <laughs> and a couple of months ago, I was down in uh, Milton, down there, Auburn there at a thing on a Sunday and this woman uh, comes up to me and said, can you get my car to run? She's heard about me, you know? Yes, your fame is spreading. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the mechanics the night before checked it out 
over an hour, and they said the fuel pump in the gas tank is gone. I said, okay, I don't care. So about after we had a, a brunch, a salmon feed, you know, and a buffet thing, and then we went out, about a dozen of us went out afterward to watch me. And I opened the hood up, and I scanned over it. I check it, and I said, hmm, something's funny. I said, crank it over, battery's almost dead. So I take my little uh, flashlight, yes, which has been witnessed before by other people, and I, and I shine the flashlight on the positive terminal on the battery, yes, shut it off, take it out, put my hands over the car again, and I said, okay, now start it, and the thing just cranks over and fires right up. That's like amazing. Just like it was fully charged. That's and I said, amazing. I said, idle it for about 15 minutes at a high idle, and you'll be able to drive home. And she went to a, a, a church sermon that afternoon at 2 o'clock, and uh, she drove it home. Next morning, she gets into the start. It won't run. Uh-oh. They towed it to the, uh, spent $40 to tow it to the shop. She deals with in Renton. And the, they found the fuel pump was absolutely no good, completely gone. I don't know, Ralph. You're amazing. <laughs> well, let's get let's get some more pictures out here. Um, while you're looking for a picture, I um, pointed this out to you, but some of our viewers may not know about this. There's a book called Extraterrestrials Among Us, and um, on uh, on page 29, there is a text of a of an ET law, and this apparently is an executive order that. Um, and it says that this part establishes NASA or NASA policy, responsibility and authority to guard the earth against any harmful contamination or adverse changes in its environment resulting from personnel, spacecraft, and other property returning to the earth after landing on or coming within the atmospheric envelope of a celestial body, and B, security requirements, restrictions, and safeguards that are necessary in the interest of national security. And so this has to do with um, individuals who may have been contacted by um, any alien, any alien uh, forces, and they're sort of laying down that people who do this, um, I guess, are quarantined or whatever. I don't know, but there's so many people who, who have had these sightings that I don't see how they could possibly enforce it. But I think it's interesting that they had something on the books for mm -hmm. that. And you had not heard of that. Oh, I've heard of that in the past, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was kind of but interesting. I, the, that book I'm not familiar that with. That book, mm -hmm. That's the only thing. Yeah, interesting. Okay, what do you have here? This is back in uh, December 3rd of 1995. Mm -hmm. I went down to, uh, to my mother's. I was down, got down there the second. In Florida. In Florida, in Port mm -hmm. Charlotte, Florida. And the first thing she told me about, she was seeing this object for three weeks, shining a beam of light in her bedroom every night around 3 o'clock, every single night. Interesting. And uh, the local people in, in Port Charlotte said, oh, that's the North Star. The North Star isn't south towards Fort Myer. No. <laughs> you know, down towards the Gulf, tip of Florida and everything. No way. And she got me out of bed at 3 in the morning, and I went out with my two Nikon cameras, an FA and, and, an, and an F3, with my telephoto lenses and even my normal lenses, I could see this round object bigger than a harvest moon. Just see a ring. So this is a pure white ring, almost like an eclipse. But on the bottom, it was shooting a beam of light directly out of her bedroom. Interesting. And I estimated, looking at the map, it was maybe five, six miles away. And, uh, so this is a photograph of photogra that? I, I tried to take a photograph of it, and my camera locked up immediately. I had it on automatic, and so I laid the camera down, and the first thing I did was put my hand over the lens and put a lens cap on it in case I got something mm. so I wouldn't overexpose. Mm. Then I, I pulled the other camera up and tried the same thing happened. I said, something's funny here. This is, this is real. They don't want me to photograph them. Then I come back to, the, to Seattle here, and I get this picture on my film. It's amazing. But the next night I went out, she got me up again. We went out. And I tried to work the cameras. And they wouldn't work again. And all of a sudden, a cloud covers it. And yet the sky was clear. Interesting. The cloud came from absolutely nowhere. So why do you think they don't want you to photograph them? I think they were just teasing me. Ah. 
So we have another photo. Is this another? Um, this is another one here. This is taken. These are beautiful, by on, the way. On, on December uh, 28th at 940 in the evening. This is really funny. Where was this taken? Port Shell, in my mother's house. Say, same, same place. Same mother's. And uh, I went out. No, what we're doing, we're watching the X-Files. Oh. And it was 940. She always likes to watch the X-Files. And I had this loud ring in my left ear. And uh, I didn't say anything. Then she says the same thing. She had this loud ring in her left ear. And I said to her, there's a UFO ship over the house. Is that what that means when you have a ringing in your ear? It, it, to me, that's when I get all my pictures. Really? Because I've had ringing in my ears, too. And, uh, but I didn't know what it was. Then I, get a vo I had my camera pre-set up for nighttime, in case I saw something. This time, I was, instead of using uh, electronically, I used manual. I set my camera at a 15th of a second exposure. Mm -hmm. And uh, F4 in the lens. So I get a voice message that says, go outside and take two pictures only. A woman's voice in my head. This is clear as day. So I get up, I go grab the camera, go out the door, and I look up in the sky directly over the front door, and I see the Palladian stars. I go, click, click. That's all I did. Then I said, I'm going to take four more. So and your, your camera froze up? No, it didn't freeze. I rotated around, took them different directions, and the film's blank, those four. And the first two pictures, <laughs> that was number one in the roll of film. Oh, my. And this is number two, and it even shows a figure eight up in the, in the upper corner here. Oh, yes. And some people are saying, oh. I don't know if, they can, if the camera can pick this up. It's pretty dark. People are saying, oh, you're shaking, but there's seven UFOs in it, in it doing zigzags. Really? And they start from the edge of the paper, the film here, all the way down to almost the middle. And zig doing all zigzag, even uh, figure eights in each one. So that's, that's what these are? That's what these mm -hmm. images are? That's what they are. Gosh, this is incredible. And yet, it's perfectly centered in the picture. And yet, I could not see them with a naked eye. Ah, uh, amazing. You're amazing, Ralph. Well, now you've got some spaceships, don't you, to share with us? Mm -hmm. Some pictures? I mean, you have so much I, stuff. I have, I have a lot of them, you, which are, you can't see much on, on the film. That just You see them doing zigzags. Well, what, what were those other, those, um, that one, what's that? Okay, this, this one here. This man has his whole book full. Oh, I got. I mean, it's only part of the collection, right? <laughs> right, it's only part of it. This I took on the 21st at 9, at uh, 11.46 p.m. over in Issaquah up in the plateau in front of the Providence Point Retirement Center. I know right where that is. And uh, I was with this friend of mine up in the, that night, Sunday night, and we were talking about, I was telling about all my unexplained experiences, which I had never really told her. I've told her only a couple over the year and a half, or I've known her. And uh, we're talking about UFOs and stuff, and uh, about 10.30 that night, I'm sitting in the chair talking to her, and all of a sudden, I get this loud ring, which hurt in my right ear. Mm -hmm. It really hurt. I bent down, put my hand over my ear. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, oh, oh, there's a ship over the house. I know that right now. So the minute, about 20 or 12, she says that she wants to go to bed. She's tired. So I, I go leave, and I get in my van, set my camera up immediately before I even turn the key on. Oh, gosh. Because I keep it next to me all the time. <laughs> and I put it on manual. Daytime is automatic. Nighttime it's manual. And I set it for an eighth of a second. And I had it at F4. So I go out the east gate of the retirement center. And I take a right and I go down. The road swings around down to the, go down the bottom of the hill. I pass the, the south gate and I pull over and stop. Mm -hmm. And I get out and take, I guess I took three pictures. The first one, nothing on it. The second one, I get this object. And the, th the third one was nothing. Then I left. Then uh, this past week, I went back. We had a nice, clear night to try to duplicate it. Mm -hmm. There was no moon. Mm -hmm. And the minute I got there, about f five minutes or so, the police show up. Get out of here. Really? Yeah. Get out. He followed me up, so I couldn't get any pictures because he had his oh. lights on. Uh-oh. But he shut him <coughs> off, and I tried to take something, nothing, because I knew something was there. Because I already had a, I was notified that there would be something, but that upset that. Mm. Well, <clears throat> you told me earlier that you have been aboard a craft. Right. I, I want to hear about that. I, I have, uh, this was back, uh, I'm trying to think, was it 87, I believe. I was over in the Orcas Island, 
And it was during the day, I had this, some, uh, I get these psychic visions, they, they come back to me. Some I, are, are in advance mm -hmm. of the future and some mm -hmm. are current. Mm -hmm. or, and this one showed up where I saw myself in a UFO, it was a round disc, I could look out over 180 degrees out the side of it. I could see the sky almost above me. And I could see this round tubular shape behind me. That must have been eight, 10 feet from the outer edge. And uh, it was kind of hovering over this area. And the clearing was shaped like a letter K, like it was like a power line clearing or, or an oil line clearing, you know? And we're right the, in the V part of the, the K. And I see this bird coming. With four wings, giant bird, bigger than, let's say, a small plane, like a Piper Cub or something like that. It was much bigger than that. And this bird has four wings, a long neck. You're talking about a live bird? Live bird, flying. It had four people on it, dressed like we are, in our clothing. You mean riding it? That riding sounds like something out of fairy bit. tales. Right. Then off to my left, another one comes with two people on it. That's really bizarre. And, I'm, and there's another person standing next to me, and where two of us are analyzing this. I said, this is really strange. And the sky was pink, and the trees were nothing like here on Earth. No comparison. They're real close together, extremely tall, and there was no branches on them. It was only in the top of the tree. It was like evergreens. And I made the comment, you need a flashlight to go through the forest. It's so dark. Mm, interesting. It was very dark in there. So, um, do you think you were on another uh, planet? I think so. And I've run across other people who've had the same vision. Really? A woman in Montana who saw the same <coughs> thing with different types of birds and animals. Do you have any idea where that might be? No idea. Absolutely no idea. Do you have any idea where these vessels are coming from? No. Are they ours? Are no, United they're, States they're not ours. They're not ours. It's like a, I was seeing them back in the late 40s and the 50s. We didn't have the technology back then or the materials that do this kind of stuff. Well, at least that we know of. Even that we know of. Really? Because the metals we have even t t today still aren't really capable of doing what these ships do at the speed they travel. They go beyond the speed of light. Well, yes, I, I'm sure that's true. To be able to go from point planet to planet, you know, and travel mm -hmm. the universe. Mm -hmm. There's no way they could... Uh, well, they have captured some of those ships, right, yeah. and um, they're doing some back engineering Back engineering. That's where we're getting a lot of our technology today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, like when I was back in uh, 1971, this is another strange thing. After I had met my wife, wife you know, to be, I had a race car team. I was running two... Uh, two Porsches at Daytona, which I took eighth overall and second in my class in one of my cars. And uh, then the next race was Sebring, but in between Daytona and Sebring, uh, I came home from my shop about 12.30 every night because I had a crew working for me. We would do uh, regular production work with street cars during the day. Then from six o'clock on to midnight was the race car. So you were, you were playing around with racing cars? Racing cars, yeah. Day and night. Day, daytime was street cars yes. for people, customers, to pay the bills. Oh, oh, oh. what do you in, mean? You were in, repairing I was, them? I was repairing. I was in the I had a Porsche repair shop. Oh, my gosh. No wonder you know so much about vehicles. <laughs> and uh, this one night, I come home before 1230. I get cleaned up. I get in bed. She liked her bedroom pitch black. And uh, she said uh, to me, oh, you got your watch fixed. I said, I don't have a watch on. And I look at my wrist, there's a diamond watch, 36 diamonds sparked into my wrist. And you never, it wasn't yours. I couldn't feel it. It wasn't mine. I'd never seen it before. You couldn't feel it? Couldn't feel it. And we look at the time on it, she and I, and it says 25 to 1. We look at the clock, the same time. Was well, this a real watch or just a hologram? It was a hologram. It was a hologram. It's a hologram. Amazing. Then uh, I said, turn the light on disappears. <gasps> well, said, yeah, well, it makes sense if it's a hologram. I would think so. If the light went on, it could maybe... But I see holograms during the daytime. Do you really? Oh, yes. <gasps> Gosh. And uh, then I said, turn it back off. Didn't reappear. Then three days later, 
An associate of mine gives me that watch, exact watch. Oh my. Was on my wrist. Oh my. <laughs> Why did he give it to you? He didn't need it. It was given to him, I guess, and I needed a watch, so he gave it to me. Did you tell him about what you had seen? Oh yes. After before he gave it to no. you? No. Never. I never told anybody. Just oh, that is that is really wild. Here, let me. This is wild. I don't know, Ralph. Do you have a lot of friends? Yeah, yeah I got quite a few. <laughs> I, mean, I think you're, you know. I got a, I, <laughs> this is amazing. Look at this watch. I still have it today. <laughs> this is amazing. Did, so this just appeared. I mean, just you appeared. know, out yep. of yeah. Out of nowhere, and here I get it as a gift three days later. That's amazing. In that the box. Is, that's amazing. Brand new. I kind of wore it out a little bit. Yeah, it looks like it's had uh, wearing. Now, do you have some pictures of the uh, anything other than? I mean, you know, do you have clear pictures of what the vessels look like? At no, all? The, this is the closest they've come to me right now. Really? Uh, where I can get a picture of this last. But they communicate with you. They communicate, you know. And it's telepathic. It's all telepathic. Uh, they tell me uh, things that happened. It was going to happen. Like. Uh, Somehow, I'm able to predict things to the exact minute, which I don't know if any psychics can do. Wow. And what's going to happen? Well, have they told you anything about what's going to happen to the United States? Or, I mean, I've, been, I've been seeing stuff, which isn't nice. Really? I don't see many people. Hmm. I don't see any cars hardly at all. Really? Everything is run down, destroyed, just about. I've been seeing a lot of that this year. For the last two months. Do you think that is um, as a result of of meteors or anything like that? Possibly. I've had a vision of a comet mm -hmm. back in January 6th. About uh, 10 in the morning, I saw that I was astral traveling. I saw the comet coming this way. Then at 2 o'clock that afternoon, I was behind it. Mm -hmm. Then February 7th, I had the same vision again. And normally when it does that, Something's true, inaccurate, but I don't know date, time, or anything on that. And uh, I've seen uh, a com comet or object hit in the Pacific Ocean, northeast of Hawaii, which could t cause a, a major tidal wave. I've seen a gorge like the Columbia Gorge going from Seattle to California. Hmm. In full detail. All these things, I see them like I'm watching video. Interesting. And uh, like back, which, when I first really started seeing things like that was back in 65, when uh, this neighbor kid uh, who lived in the neighborhood joined the Air Force after he got out of high school. And while he was in high school, he had to work for me because he was getting in trouble. You know? Uh-oh. <laughs> in high school, his father made rules. He had to work for me mm -hmm. after school. And when he joined the Air Force, he went to Texas, and uh, his brother comes over and tells me at the, my shop and says, because uh, I have my shop at my house, he says, Tommy's coming home on a three-day leave, I mean, a 10-day leave, and mm -hmm. uh, I said, oh, don't let him get on a motorcycle. And he said, why? And I said, he's going to get killed on uh, this certain Thursday uh, when he's back uh, Oh my gosh! at 4.37 in the afternoon, and I had witnesses around me all the time when this happened. I told him. Oh, my him. gosh. Oh, Ralph. And... Terrible responsibility. And I t told his parents. I, I went back to his brother many times. Yes. And I told him when he came back, mm -hmm. don't get on a motorcycle. Mm -hmm. And this one day at my shop, about 4 o'clock, I told my customers. I had about five of them standing there. And one was a, one's a well-known doctor now, went to Harvard Medical, mm. who was stationed here in Seattle at the Children's Hospital for 20 years on, really? on diseases, infectious disease, diseases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now he's back in Boston. He went back a couple years ago. And... Uh, Exactly as I said happened. I, what I did, he I saw. He went anyway. He went anyway, and he was going to challenge this because he didn't believe it. No, he just ignored me. Hmm. They thought it was just, oh, you know, n impossible. No one could predict things like that. And it did happen. And uh, two of my customers went up there and saw it, and they never, I never saw them again. <laughs> I scared them. And uh, the Air Force came and investigated me after that because I could astral travel and see things into the future so well 
They wanted to hire you, did they? No, they <laughs> wanted to know how. They actually wanted to know how I did it, mm -hmm. and I couldn't tell them much. Mm -hmm. I said it just comes to me naturally, because mm -hmm. I could see myself flying above him as he was riding on the motorcycle, mm -hmm. looking down on him like I was a bird, or a helicopter to follow him above, just like I was a bird, really, just above the treetops. Why do you think that would happen to him? You know, I mean, was there? Have you ever thought deeper than that? No, never could figure it out. He was a great kid too. Do people come to you to do psychic readings? I don't and do things? that. You don't do any of that. No, I, these things. Uh, like one of the, the latest one was uh, oh, one they had one in, at Sebring, Florida, in 1971, because I was attracted by the press because I had uh, my co-driver in one of my cars was Pete Conrad, the astronaut. Oh. Like. You have a picture there. I got. Uh, it's on the back side of this area. Here, I'll take it. There, it's in the. This one here. All right, this one here. It's got it's almost that shiny effect. Will affect Which it. Which one? There's Conrad. This whole all newspaper clip. Oh, it's out okay. of the Tampa well, we, newspaper. We can't read it. We can just maybe pull it up for verification here. So the press were around me quite a bit, and where I started 28th on the grid and 29th, and both my car numbers were 28 and 29. Oh, interesting. And after uh, it was a 12-hour race, after seven hours in the race at 6 p.m., because it starts at 11 a.m., the reporters all came to interview me uh -huh. from all over the world. There's at least a dozen reporters. Oh my gosh. From Japan, Germany, and Europe and everything. And wow. What a legacy. And one of them asked me the question, uh, how am I going to do against a competitor of mine mm -hmm. from New Hampshire? Mm. And he was running. I was eighth overall, and he was like 13th or 14th at the time. And I told him, oh, 937. He, this is 6 p.m. He's going to, it's going to be in the pits. Well, his left front brake just broken in his car. And I saw myself standing there, even though I'm talking to these reporters, in his pits watching this happen. Oh, my gosh. And at 9.37, exactly as I said, to the minute, the car comes in the pits. Okay, now some people would probably say that maybe you were causing this through your mind. That's what I heard. It was, they had it in the papers analyzing me mm -hmm. for two days down there, I heard, mm -hmm. from an astronaut told me this. Back in the, oh, the early 90s, I met, in Seattle here. He Is told me he... Brian? Brian I don't O'Leary? recall his name. Brian O'Leary? No, it wasn't him. Greg or Mitchell? Uh, they read about me in the paper, and this astronaut was at Sebring that same race. Oh, really? At the time, when he was younger, before he became an astronaut. Oh. He and his father went to the race. And uh, he said they, they, they thought I sabotaged the car, mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. And they f decided it was impossible for me to sabotage, because they researched. Amazing. Then I had a, a friend of mine I've known since... Uh, 1970, this German gentleman from Boston, he works for a Japanese company. And was it uh, when they had the Kobe earthquake that year? Was it 95, I think? I don't or, remember. I've, I've forgotten mm -hmm. just what year it was. But mm -hmm. he called me up about the 4th of January and said, I'm going to Japan. I said, just like, don't go instantly on the phone. And he said, why? And I saw myself again hovering over Japan. I could see the outline of the island as I'm talking to him. And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm standing in Kobe. I knew the name of the city. I said, there's going to be an earthquake here. It's going to be 7.2 on the Richter scale at 5.47 in the morning. And it gave an exact minute. You know, Ralph, this sounds a little like the remote viewing that we've been hearing a lot about. Yeah, I think that's what the Air Force started doing after they interviewed me back in 65, started researching it. Because it didn't start, remote viewing start to sometime after 65. Well, it's a label, though, you know. Yeah. Uh, and the phenomena has been done a long time. It's just that they gave it a name. Right. And that's been popularized. So, but up until that point, it's they a, were still it, doing it, but it was... But I go places mm -hmm. and see everything to the minute into mm -hmm. the future. How many other people do you know who've done this? Uh, I don't know if anybody has done it to the minute. I've that's, asked. That's pretty and, precise. And uh, like to know the, what it is in the Richter scale. Mm -hmm. And I even told him what buildings are still standing. There's several buildings. And I said it looked just like Hiroshima hit. It's amazing. I, 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 he couldn't believe it. He went and he left there four hours before it happened. He was flying back to Boston. <laughs> really? Yeah. And then he calls me up in Boston and said, how in the world did you ever know that in such detail? Yeah, because it's not like you're going there physically. No. I can be here and be there at the same time. Of course, of course, of course, by locating. Like I could be talking to you. Right. And be down in L.A. or over in Germany or somewhere. 
the same time. It just, I, it's just unbelievable, really. And does the government bother you at all? No. They, they did bother me one time. They came to me and told me to keep my mouth shut. Mm -hmm. And I told them the First Amendment, freedom of speech, everything. I said, you have no rights. I have my rights. Leave me alone. They never bothered me again. Really? Do you think it's because you stood up to them? It could be. I had no fear in them. Well, they, they want to um, impart fear. So right. if you're fearless, which I am, then they can't control you. That's another thing I get. I get these tests. I'll be at sleep at night, and my dreams will be put me through fear tests. Mm -hmm. Like I'll be in a car out of control with some crazy friend of mine going wild, you know, on the highway or on ice or something like that, and I just have to sit there and be fully relaxed. If I fail, they put me through another test immediately afterward. Interesting. So I have no fear. And that's think why, I think that's why I see all these UFOs. Mm -hmm. I, have no, I know I've seen hundreds. There's one day in Bellevue, uh, not Bellevue, but Woodenville, a couple of years ago, it was 11 o'clock there, sitting at where QFC is now, and I was doing some paperwork, you know, waiting for noontime. And I see four of them fly right over my van, going really? south. And the wind's blowing from the s southwest, very strong wind, and dark clouds, you know, broken clouds. They get down a couple of miles south of me. I'm watching them. Only if I had a video camera. That's what I need is a video camera, camcorder. And all of a sudden, they turn sharp left. Hmm. Then all of a sudden, I see one more fall in from the west come in behind. Then I see six rows of two in formation behind them, 17 in all. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, you do. You, you need some other kind of equipment. Uh, and this past year when I was down in Florida, I received messages, go get a video camera. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking around for the best deal on one, mm -hmm. you know, something professional. I got to have professional. Mm -hmm. I cannot have amateur stuff because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. the pictures are so unbelievable. Right. Now, have you had conversations with these entities at all? Uh, I've had spiritual conversations, yes. Do they ever say that there's anything um, to life after death? They never mentioned it. But uh, back in uh, October of 95, I had a, a, over an eight-minute conversation hmm. where my radio went dead and I couldn't get anything on my radio in my van on my way to work. And I played with all the stations, couldn't get anything, AM, FM, nothing. Then all of a sudden I see this uh, woman appear on my dashboard over my windshield, my windshield on a hologram, and she says, Ralph, I have someone to introduce to you over my radio and introduces this person to me. And he's sitting on a stool with a white robe on mm. and identifies himself. As? Jesus. Oh. And <clears throat> he told me I had a shield around me and protected. It was like one time when I was five years old, I'm cutting the rope like this, which is wrong, and the knife goes in my eye. It didn't affect my eye at all. And when I was taking my pictures of the hawks in the life cycle, I fall out of a tree land on the stone wall on my back. I'm over a mile from, the, from my house in the woods, not a mark on my body. I go right back up the tree and finish photographing that day because I was doing exactly so many day cycles. Wow. And I've done cars where the, the car actually doesn't hit anybody and it levitates out of the way. That's amazing. Well, Ralph, you are, you are an enigma. <laughs> There's no question about that. And I want to thank you so much for coming and sharing your experiences with us. Um, this is kind of new for some of my viewers, but um, you really have an extraordinary gift. I know. <laughs> that's wonderful. And so, it's getting more and more of it. It's increasing now. Well, that's very exciting. Well, <clears throat> thanks again. I appreciate yeah, you coming. And uh, to you, my viewers, keep your eyes open. Look up into the heavens and see what you can see. And uh, stay tuned. You know, we don't really know, but maybe we will soon. Join me next time when we explore another avenue of our universe and our relationship to it. I'm Elaine Smitha.